you have Olivia Rodrigo giving credit to Haley Williams, Paramore on the song that she ripped off, then you better give my boy Weta some respect. Hey, what's up? My name's Alex Majewski, also known as Jay Sky. In this video, I'm gonna be talking about Nothing Nowhere. So let's get into it. Joe Mulhern, Nothing Nowhere, was born in Foxborough, Massachusetts. It's a big football town. It's really only known for the Patriots Stadium. He didn't really feel like he fit in as he wasn't in the sports or anything like that. So he started going to the skate park and that's really where he found his core community. He tried lacrosse and sports to make him cool, but he sucked and he didn't like it at all. He had been heavily involved in playing music since the age of 12, posting songs on MySpace and playing in hardcore and pop punk bands around the area. He even rapped when he was a kid, going around town and filming skateboard videos and silly skits with his friends. Nothing Nowhere was always a creative person, which you would later see come out in the visuals of his music and videos. In high school, he met some cool teachers who helped foster his creative side. He would often skip class and hang out in the art wing of school. He wasn't a great student. When he was younger, he felt extremely isolated, but he has memories of his older cousin Dan playing guitar and getting him in the bands like Dashboard Confessional. His cousin would let him play his guitar even though he didn't know what he was doing, but at that time he knew that he wanted to learn how to play. He ended up getting guitar lessons shortly after, started learning classic songs like Zeppelin and Sabbath. He never really took music seriously despite his passion for it. With the underlying fear of needing a backup plan, that kind of ran with him for years and he does regret that. In 2010, he tried showing more people his music. He would release music on sites like Peer Volume and MySpace, MySpace since 2006, and he claims that it was really bad at this time. He came from a middle-class suburban home. His dad worked for nonprofits, working with learning centers for deaf, and his mom was a nurse. He never applied himself, he was a terrible student, and he ended up going to film school because he thought that would be like a safer bet than doing music. When he first started college, he really stepped away from music for a while. Uh, he just dove into his studies, learning, doing things with film. He went to Burlington College in Burlington, Vermont, it's a college that is shut down now. It was small, like 250 kids. He started Nothing Nowhere at college. The first song that he released as Nothing Nowhere was Don't Mind Me. Don't Mind Me technically was a history project for class. His teacher said you could really make whatever you want. He was feeling weird and just wanted to do something for him. So he was like, fuck it, I'm gonna make something that I like. For a long time, his SoundCloud page had maybe like 40 followers. His sister was following him, nothing crazy. He was just uploading like rough acoustic songs and demos, things like that. His name, Nothing Nowhere, was inspired by the philosopher Alan Watts, a philosopher about the concept of nothing. The concept is like, you can't see your hand without seeing the space between your fingers. So the name stemmed out of the impermanence of life. So being away at college helped shape the direction of his vision and his music. During Joe's last year of college, he really started to come into himself as an artist. Um, he also started an internship at a video editing company. He wasn't really passionate about it and he wanted a way out. So he spoke to his dad. His dad was like, you work so hard to get this job. And he stuck with it, saved up about like $3,000 and quit. From then, he just dove head on into music, making music every single day, uploading it to SoundCloud, and finding success pretty early on in that venture. He burned through his cash extremely fast, but used some of it to start selling merch, um, and that was actually going. He couldn't believe it, that he was having an audience grow online, and they actually wanted to spend money on shirts and hoodies and things like that, I imagine he was making at the time. So April 2015, he remembers staying up until like 7, 8 a.m. At this point, he had about 1,000 followers on SoundCloud. He really wanted the momentum to just keep going. Some of the first people bigger than him to show love, Mike the Musician, the Suicide Boys. He started doing some collabs and he released a few EPs such as Bummer. No set goals, just figured something was bound to happen. It was February 2016 when phone calls started coming in because he landed on the front page of Reddit. During this time, he got calls from booking agents at Primary Talent, and every day he was getting more and more calls, but he didn't have a team and he was completely independent. It was around this time that his manager, Evange, reached out and was now able to help him navigate things. Joe suffered with extreme levels of anxiety. He actually disassociated. He wouldn't recognize his room or his parents, and music was just the biggest way for him to cope and express himself. Um, he talks about all the time how his music is there to help people, or at least it makes him feel like it does. Um, and I'm sure he learned those values from his parents. His mother was a nurse, like I said before, and his father worked for nonprofits, helping a lot of children and different organizations. The first real show he had was actually opening for the Suicide Boys in Boston, which is pretty nuts, but he didn't know where he fit in. So like he was playing 
emo singer-songwriter, just him and the guitar up there, alone on a dark stage, wearing a hoodie where no one could really even see his face. And the Suicide Boys come in there just crazy, bumping with these beats and screaming and singing. Um, so he, he had some people showing love and there was also a lot of people not. So at this time, he was just kind of indifferent. He's like, should I play shows? Where should I fit in? Where could I fit in? So Nothing Nowhere originally was all just like acoustic demos. So Never Forever is where he took all of those songs that was on the Nothing Nowhere page and he posted them. Everything else moving forward was really what he was trying to show the world. During this time around 2016, he was having crazy amounts of growth. He had his manager, he was getting calls left and right, and he was constantly making meetings out to Los Angeles and New York to meet with pretty much every single record company. He said a lot of just like the, the rumors of how sketchy they could be and just trying to get you to be someone else was extremely prominent during these times and he was just kind of overwhelmed and sketched out and then he got a really lucky call his manager called him one day he was up in vermont just chilling and she was like hey pete once really likes your music i want to he wants to talk to you in like 30 minutes um so pick up the call so he's just sweating as i could imagine i would be freaking the fuck out if pete once was going to call me but that literally would be the coolest shit ever so he gets a call from pete once and that's actually who he signed with Pete Wentz, someone he grew up idolizing, having posters on his wall, and now he's getting a record deal with the bass player of Fall Out Boy. His first self-titled LP, Nothing Nowhere, was rough, but you could hear the great ideas in there. There was motifs that he was starting that would later come out and other songs that he'd have along the way. In the Bummer EP in 2015, on the song Weight of the World, he has a big emo chorus. In the song Gutter, he raps, has melancholic guitars and emo rap drums, followed by the 2016 Deadbeat Valentine single. When his music started to really elevate to the next level, the production, the songwriting was on the song I'm Sorry I'm Trying. And you can see that reflected just in the stream counts. It's almost 33 million streams on Spotify alone. Nothing Nowhere is one of those artists that just has such a crazy discography, way more than most artists, so many EPs, singles, full albums. So I'm definitely not gonna be naming all of them and there will be some left out, but I'm gonna mention some of the ones that are my favorite and definitely had a lot of success along the way. Let Down 2016, he had great lyrics. Like, so I'll drive all night through my hometown. You can drive your knife through my chest now. I'm gonna crash my car by your old house because all I'll ever be is a letdown. Deep lyrics, really creating just a visual um, and just making you feel what it's like to be hopeless in your hometown, um, hurt by an ex or whatever it is. And he just kind of painted that picture of just the world that he was existing. He didn't show his face. He was mysterious. He had angst to him. And although he did have influences that were from, say, the emo rap scene and all those genres, he was different. There was something different about him. He was a great vocalist. He could rap really well. He produced unique beats. He wasn't getting a lot of these things from other people, so he sounded unique to himself, which is very special. Reaper was the first substantial record that really pushed him to the next level. It would be around this time that he started to gain notoriety for songs like Scully, Hopes Up featuring Dashboard Confessional with the vocalist Chris Caraba. He's obviously heavily influenced by him. This was the artist that really got him into playing guitar when he was 12 years old. This is an artist that would sing acoustically and do kind of what looks like his one take. So you could see just early on, this is a direction that he wanted to go into. Clarity and Kerosene, which I believe he released acoustically years later. You could see it on his Spotify under his side project. Funeral Fantasy, this record was badass and had so much emotion and angst. His follow-up record, Runer, had much more mellow songs across the board, but there were some standout ones like Sinker, the song Hammer, which may be one of his most well-known songs. Even the band Point North kind of got all their notoriety based off of a Nothing Nowhere song that was like popular the same year or so. The band did it great. They kind of made it their own, but it is pretty funny just to think that they, they used like a song that was popular like around that time to kind of drive their career forward. So people hear it and they think it's their song, but it's really a Nothing Nowhere song. It's also to be noted that on Runer and Reaper is when he started to work with other producers. And this really helped to push and evolve his sound and take it to the next level. He worked a lot with JV and Falls and Eric Ron. Hammer Lurks were some of my favorite. It was Play the Guitar Like a Young Santana, Reppin' VT Like My Name's Bernie Sanders, Living Two Laws Like My Name Danny Phantom, All My Shit Bang Like a Motherfucking Hammer. It's just super dope. It's swaggy. It's emo rap, but he does his own thing. Um, and this song just was awesome. Every time it comes on, I'm always hyped in the car. Everyone loves the song. In 2018, he dropped more singles like Dread, Ornament, Callback, just back-to-back -back bangers, like he said in The Hammer. 
It's around this time that Nothing Nowhere really has the opportunity to level up and work with Travis Barker, the infamous drummer from Blink-182, huge producer, star from reality TV shows on MTV. Nothing Nowhere is one of the first artists to really have Travis Barker do that at this time. Shortly after, you're gonna see tons of people like Machine Gun Kelly, Kenny Hoopla, the record was Bloodlust, he has songs like Destruction, and he even has a feature with Black Bear who's written with everyone, like the song Boyfriend for Justin Bieber and countless other ones. Um, this isn't my favorite record, but it was a really big launching pad and just kind of gave him clout and more skin in the game to move things forward. Just like that, he thinks his career is probably about to pop off, really go to the next level, which it ultimately does, but the pandemic hits. Everyone's home. They have nothing to do. There's no studio sessions. There's no live touring. He's literally building up and at the height of what's supposed to be the biggest moment of his career, it has to come to a stop. So what does he do? He's always been creating tons of content. He starts doing one takes. He starts going through his catalog, all these songs I had mentioned before. Maybe he had his own home at this time. I know he has one like in Vermont or Maine. Um, the parents have a house in Vermont and he's using all these rooms and this beautiful scenery with the snow behind him and doing really like intimate performances, just acoustic guitar and him singing. For sure there are some overdubs because I know there's extra vocals and things like that. I know he's good and I've seen him do Twitch live streams and he's playing them so 100% he could crush it and do it well, but he definitely like probably played it to like a click track in his headphones and dubbed in some backing vocals and some like little leads and things like that. And there's no shade on that because later on he actually released like a full album of these one takes. Um, and this guy's fucking crazy. He's really good. Follow up Trauma Factory, although the album cover looks like really rugged and dark, it was probably his poppiest record to date. With songs like Fake Friend, Pretend, Blood featuring Kenny Hoopla, Buck, Upside Down. And he started working with big producers and writers like Zach Servini and Jake Torrey, who actually went to Berklee College of Music with. These are heavy hitters who were writing and producing hits for like everybody. So obviously at this point in time, himself and the labels are really trying to push him and cross him over to a larger audience. It's on this album that he does have those crossover hits. Now that he's, it's kind of like a mix between the style that he was and more of a pop thing. One of the singles that he would drop later, which is one of my favorite songs, so I'm gonna talk a little bit of shit, is the song Pieces of You. This song is awesome. They had crazy hit makers producing and writing with him that are doing all kinds of records. So the thing is that the chorus sounds a lot like Teenage Dirtbag, and my boy Weedus needs to get like a little bit of props for that. I feel like that song, uh, Teenage Dirtbag, came back so hard, had such a revival, and he's playing like little shitty venues in the city. Dude had like one hit, and I don't know if he doesn't have a team or management, but whatever it is, he should get a little bit of love. Don't be hating on my boy Weedus like that. Yo, tell me that Pieces of You does not sound a whole lot like Teenage Dirtbag. So this is Nothing Nowhere's Pieces of You chorus. <laughs> And this is Weedus's Teenage Dirtbag Chorus. You tell me if that shit doesn't sound alike, then you better give my boy Weedus some credit on the Pieces of You Nothing Nowhere song. Stop playing. Nothing Nowhere is someone who's very like to himself, he's a homebody, um, but if you had like MGK on the Pieces of You song, I think that song would have been a fucking huge radio hit. It had success, but with MGK, just like imagine him with his low voice singing, I took a piece of you in my pocket, last night I almost lost it. It would fucking crush, dude, I know it. I'm sure he loved the success that came with Trauma Factory, but being an anxious person, someone that really likes to stay to themselves and just kind of abandoning his roots and going so pop when he's more of just like an underground kind of darker person, his music, his personality, everything about him is just like a little more subdued and chill. I would imagine that he was starting to freak the fuck out and that's when you're gonna see him make the transition, not only to like his melancholy rapper roots, but he's gonna take it to the next level with the follow-up album and go like 2005 fucking post-hardcore like, Metalcore, it's fucking dope. One of my favorite styles and it's a sick record. He collabs with everybody from Under Oath to Silverstein to See You Space Cowboy and he's just utilizing that shit. He's collabing the fuck out of it. He's making high level productions, still good songs and he's showcasing everything that's him in one place. Um, and this is just an album that 
is so much different than anyone's really doing and it's different than everything he had before while he's still holding on to his true identity. Nothing Nowhere is a great guitarist. You could see him playing like Midwestern emo style guitar and all kinds of hammer-ons and pull-offs. I'm a guitarist, I vouch for him. Dude could play guitar and I'm sure there's a lot more he could do that just doesn't fit into the music that he's doing. But if he needed to flex and do some more leads or chugs or something, I'm sure he could. And he is a great voice. He is the raspy, melancholy thing. He could belt, he could scream, he could rap fucking dope. Um, and he's proved time and time again to be awesome at producing. Yes, I know throughout time I've been saying he's adding more producers and writers and things like that. It's obvious that the consistency throughout it is him. There's tons of people that work with these same writers and producers that are not making great content. He doesn't fucking miss. It's always dope. They're memorable. Now we're here at Void Eternal, which is the metalcore record that he's made, caught up to present day. He's doing great. I still visit his old catalog going up through the modern shit he's dope he's definitely influenced me he's influenced a lot of people i'm a huge nothing nowhere fan and i want to say once again thank you guys so much for tuning in i know there were some people in my when emo rap took the world by storm video that i kind of teased in there saying like i'm gonna make a nothing nowhere video next week i didn't it's two weeks later but this one's for you guys um i did want to address it there's like no content online about the discography of Nothing Knower, which is a shame. He has like a million plus monthly listeners on Spotify. Thank you so much. I'm Alex Majewski, J Sky. Thanks for tuning in. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, follow me on IG, hit me up. If there's anything I left out from his discography or just cool information that I didn't mention, um, leave it in the comments. Maybe I'll mention it in just like a random part of another video at some point in time, and I just love to read about it. Um, you guys are always chatting in the comments, and it's fucking awesome. Um, I'm newer to this. This is like my literally like fifth video, um, and it's been like a really great experience. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate the support, and I'll see you next week. Peace.